the Claire Booth Loose Center has been a huge friend and big friend of this, this class for many years and brought us fantastic speakers for many semesters. So thank you, Carolyn, if you're watching. Thank you. And now to introduce our speaker today. This is right behind me here. This is Amber Athey. Making her first appearance at Poli-Sci 179. She is the Washington editor, and she just flew in from Washington today just to speak to you, true story, and she'll be flying back out tomorrow morning. Uh, she's the Washington editor at The Spectator, and previously she was a writer for The Daily Caller, at which um, she was the White House correspondent at, what, at one point, so someone with tremendous experience. She also co-hosted a radio show on WMAL. Amber is a graduate of Georgetown University. Any reaction? Don't get tough answered. It's okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, where she studied government and economics with a minor in math, which I don't quite understand. But please welcome <laughs> Amber Athey. Uh, no, I'm not Mike. We can edit this part out. Democrat, 
but it is an outrage that I pay some of the highest taxes in the country for these social services and the infrastructure in our police department, and we're not getting what we're paying for. People like this guy know that there will be no consequences for their actions, and yet my party, the Democrat Party, is calling for even less enforcement. This might seem like a relatively small issue, more an annoyance or a nuisance than something that's life-threatening, obviously, but this kind of sentiment about growing frustration towards a lack of enforcement on crime is growing across the country. Americans of all political stripes, and particularly moderate Democrats who are scared to say it out loud, but still feel it or express it privately among friends, are seeing the effects of lax enforcement of criminal statutes and are horrified at what's been happening in their communities. Some 2021 polling from Gallup illuminates the mood of the public. 53% of Americans say that they worry about crime a great deal, which is the highest level since 2016. 80% worry about it at least a fair amount. And this puts crime as one of the top issues that Americans worry about the most just behind inflation and the economy. According to a Politico and Morning Consult poll that just came out last week, more than three quarters of voters said violent crime is a major problem in the United States. Only 17% said that crime is a minor problem and only 2% said that it was not a problem at all. About three quarters of those same respondents said that they believe violent crime is increasing nationally while 88% said it was either staying the same or increasing in their own communities. And finally, 60% said that crime would play a major role in who they vote for in the upcoming election. This is a political science class, I believe, so I do want to remind you that perception does matter, right? The way that people view issues and the way they feel about their communities is important uh, for how they vote. And a lot of people do vote on intuition and not on data. Ultimately, telling people not to trust their intuition or their gut or their feelings is a losing battle. But that being said, while crime data is not always perfectly reported and can certainly be complicated depending on which issues you choose to look at, there's plenty of evidence to back up this feeling among Americans that crime is getting worse. Homicides have increased nationally between uh, 2019 to 2020 from 5.1 per 100,000 people in 2019 to 6.5 homicides per 100,000 people in 2020. As of this summer, Washington, D.C., where I live, is recording a 12% increase in violent crime compared to 2021. L.A. came in with an 8.6% increase this year. Philadelphia and Baltimore have reported increases of 7% and 6.1% respectively. Atlanta saw a violent crime increase of 5.5%. And New York City has seen a shocking 25.8% jump in violent crime as of June of 2022 compared to the same time last year. Even when you look at places where overall crime rates are slightly down between 21 and 2022, it's sort of like celebrating gas prices decreasing from an average of $5 a gallon, although I see here it's like six, uh, to $4.50 a gallon when just a few years ago gas was $2 a gallon, right? That is to say, crime rates in 2021 were significantly higher when compared to previous years, so even a slight decrease from 21 to 2022 is not a huge thing to celebrate and certainly isn't going to tamp down the fears of most Americans. There have been dramatic spikes in homicide rates in most major cities, such as in 2021, Philadelphia reported its highest ever number of homicides in a single year, 561. Its previous record was all the way back in 1990, where they recorded 500. So far this year, they've already recorded 388 homicides, which puts them on track to set a, another new record. New York saw 485 murders in 2021, the highest level in about a decade. In addition to violent crime, there have also been nationwide spikes in carjackings. For example, again, in Washington, D.C., where I live, an Uber driver and father was killed after two teenagers attempted to hijack his vehicle, and he sped away into a traffic light. There have been sprees of organized smash and grabs at storefronts across the country, as well as an overall increase in property crimes, such as burglary, when compared to pre-pandemic levels. I want to take the moment to point out that the pandemic, of course, does play a big role in the rise of crime, whether for economic reasons, loneliness, 
um, people being out of work, or any of the other usual factors that would go into someone choosing to commit a crime. For decades, progressives have been championing criminal justice reform, alleging that the justice system is awash with institutionalized racism. They wanted police departments, prosecutors, and lawmakers to change their approach to law enforcement to address the fact that they believed racial minorities were treated more harshly than white people, and I think that's a commendable goal. This movement became more mainstream with the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, uh, Missouri in 2014. In the aftermath, cities across the country elected scores of progressive prosecutors who promised that they would reimagine policing and criminal justice. A renewed push came after the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020, with major progressive activist organizations and Democratic elected officials taking things a step further and calling for defunding the police, or in some cases they would say that they wanted to reallocate spending. Unfortunately, a lot of the policies being championed by these progressive groups had the side effect of allowing a whole lot of violent crime to go unchecked. In 2020, budget votes, advocacy groups won over $840 million in direct cuts from U.S. police departments. Some of you in here will probably clap for that. Austin, Texas has made some of the most dramatic changes, directly cutting roughly $20 million from the police department and moving about another $80 million away from the agency. Also in 2021, Austin saw a record number of homicides. Many California localities, including San Francisco, reduced the penalties for shoplifting and raised the monetary limit for these thefts to be considered a felony. In the aftermath, organized criminal, criminal groups exploited these new rules and cleaned out businesses across the state. Police and security guards were typically instructed not to make arrests for misdemeanors, so these thieves got even more brazen over the past year or two. I'm sure some of you all have seen the many viral videos of people walking out of Target with a whole bundle of shoplifted items while no one attempts to stop them. The problem got so bad that even Governor Gavin Newsom decided to take action. After costing California businesses uh, millions of dollars annually, he signed a law reestablishing as a crime organized retail theft. Unfortunately, this is common across the country. I've seen numerous examples of this in Alexandria, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Starbucks has recently closed many of its locations, including a, a flagship location in Union Station at Washington, D.C., citing the fact that many of their baristas do not feel safe behind the counter. It might sound like a small thing, petty crimes. You might even have the impulse to say, so what? These businesses have a lot of money anyway. Who cares if someone steals some of their items or smashes their windows? And naturally, the broken windows theory of policing comes into play here. The broken windows theory was introduced by George Kelling and James Wilson in 1982 when they posited that allowing too much local disorder creates a climate in which criminal behavior, including serious crimes, would be more likely because criminals would sense that public norms and vigilance were weak. The theory receives credit for helping turn around the 1990s crime wave in New York City. And even Northeastern University professor Dan O'Brien, who recently <laughs> attempted to debunk the theory in the New York Daily News, admitted that, quote, there are certain types of disorder that can create ecological advantages for criminal activity. Indeed, in major US cities, local politicians have encouraged a general lack of respect for public spaces. Public urination and defecation are enforced less frequently, if at all. Graffiti is let to go unchecked, and public parks become dumping grounds for trash. This has typically been done in the name of compassion. For example, homeless encampments are not relocated as quickly or as often, and residents are even less frequently referred to mental health or drug addiction services. Local officials say they don't want to displace people who are struggling, but what this means in practice is that citizens walking in their homes or to work are subjected to the rats and insects, smell of human feces, harassment and or violence that comes from allowing an unchecked group of unfortunately mostly mentally ill individuals to hang out on the street. And naturally, the individuals who live in these tent cities don't get the help that they need. Attempts to relocate these individual, individuals to hotels did not go as planned because Again, they didn't treat the root cause of why these people did not have homes. Project Room Key in LA County, for example, was, which was a project that housed homeless people in hotels during the pandemic, 
registered 49 deaths of residents since its inception, most of which were drug overdoses. Hotel staff suddenly found themselves not just responsible for housekeeping and check-ins, but responsible for people's lives, and other guests were driven out of the hotels due to safety and cleanliness concerns. Perhaps even more than violent crime rates, a citizen's perception that their area is inhabited by unpredictable individuals can make them feel incredibly unsafe. This certainly helps explain why in the aforementioned polls that I talked about, women are far more likely than men to say that they feel that crime is rising in their area. Things get even more dicey when we look at policies on prosecutions and bail reform. Some localities have pushed to remove cash bail entirely, while others have drastically lowered the typical bail amount for different types of crimes. Typically, bail is set based on the nature of an alleged crime, the criminal history of the perpetrator, flight risk, and among other factors, the ability of the perpetrator to pay the bill. But progressives claim that even the concept of bail is unfair to low-income individuals, even if their income is taken into consideration when that bail is set. As a result of loosening bail restrictions or eliminating cash bail entirely, there have been numerous cases where individuals accused of horrific crimes have been let back out on the street where they quickly reoffend. On a Brooklyn L train in New York City, a homeless man who was free without bail in a subway altercation was accused of stabbing a dad of two to death. Darrell Brooks was released from jail on an unusually low $1,000 cash bail just five days before killing six people and injuring dozens of others by driving his car through a Christmas parade. Darrell Brooks had a rap sheet decades long and had been recently released after allegedly battering his girlfriend and attempting to run her over with the same car. In Virginia, Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Steve Descano released Kevin Alexander Lemus without bail in April on gun and drug charges. In May, Descano released him again after he was charged for drug possession and having violated his pre-trial release. Just four months later, he would kill a man. In New York, the law still says judges must set bail only on certain offenses and only under the, quote, least restrictive condition. The result is uh, somewhat predictable. A man nicknamed Big Coop was arrested 103 times, including 16 times this year alone, but was repeatedly released until he recently stabbed a new driver to death. And even now, his bail only sits at $10,000. Alexander Wright had 41 priors, including a hate crime, before he was finally locked up for assaulting a subway cleaner. Austin Amos had 10 prior arrests, including for robbery and sexual misconduct, but was also repeatedly released until he killed a cab driver. In San Francisco, a parolee was accused of killing two pedestrians in a drunken New Year's Eve rage. These crimes are especially troublesome because they were entirely preventable. Our justice system doesn't just exist to try to fix people, its primary function can and should be to protect the public from criminals who might potentially hurt them. Seem to have lost that thread. Instead, many of them believe that criminals are the real victims due to a combination of factors beyond their control, such as systemic race, racism, or poor life circumstances. This mindset played out in real time in Minneapolis in July. Andrew Sundberg, a black man, was shot dead by police in the midst of a mental health breakdown. Protesters showed up to his apartment and demanded answers as to why he was killed. The answer? Sunberg had been indiscriminately firing shots into the apartment next door, nearly killing a Hispanic woman and her two children, and was ultimately killed by police snipers after a six-hour standoff. The mother, Arabella Yarborough, tried to reason with the protesters who had showed up outside of her home, stating that this wasn't a George Floyd situation. But the mostly white protesters dismissed her concerns for her life, telling her, quote, but you're alive. When she repeated that the bullets were flying into her home near her children, a protester yelled back, quote, not you, though. Certainly, we should orient our society toward raising up better citizens. I think that's without question. But when someone has shown they have no desire or ability to be a law-abiding member of society, the needs of the rest of the citizenry have to come first. Sometimes it really is as simple as the bad guys need to be locked up to keep the rest of us safe. Thank you. Okay.
lots of questions. Start right up front. Hi. Hello. Um, you talked about the police. I mean, you brought it up in the, uh, in the conversation. The opposite of that would be defund the police. Um, now, I'm not a proponent of defund the police. I don't think that makes much sense. But with the recent evolved issue, I think we've seen what happens when you have a police force to protect you, um, but they don't live up to the duty. So if we were to continue funding the police, which is something that I would you know, probably support, I would make sure we're not throwing money at something that's not going to do this intended job. Yeah, Can you so sum that up? Yeah, so he basically asked, you know, when we're, we are choosing to fund the police, how do we prevent police from making grave mistakes, such as in the Uvalde school shooting, where the police obviously failed to do their duty? And it's a great question. A similar thing happened in Broward County with the Parkland school shooting, where the deputies supposedly waited out behind their vehicles for, I think it was like an hour before they went to the school. They basically waited until the shooting was over. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, I'm not... A, an expert on you know police training, but I think there's no question that in those cases the police need to be held accountable. Uvalde recently fired, I think, pretty much its entire police department, which is great. Um, so yeah, making sure funding goes toward the right systems and making sure that the right people are being hired is super important. That's why I also question um, some of the side effects of really anti-police rhetoric because I do think that it might disincentivize the right people from going into the profession um, because they don't want necessarily that blowback. Um, and I also know that a lot of police departments uh, have different training standards, so maybe a nationalization of standards would be helpful too, instead of you know different localities having different standards where we can be a police officer. Uh, hi, my name is Eddie. Thanks for coming out here mm -hmm. and talking to us. You said a lot. I wish I could address a bunch of things that you said, but I'm just asking one basic question, kind of following up on what he asked you about mass shootings. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot of crimes from like nuisance crimes to like crimes that might have been preventable if there were a better bail system to just stuff that's awful, but crimes like the Uvalde shooting and other mass shootings, I think that most people would agree that those are probably the most unfortunate crimes. Um, and those could be prevented possibly, probably, if there were waiting periods to, before being allowed to buy guns <coughs> and stuff like that, and, which could be actually legislated by candidates that I think that you're advocating for. Um, is that something that the Republican Party plans to do, is to, to legislate for waiting periods in all 50 states and background checks to keep the wrong people from getting guns? It's like the guy in Uvalde, he like, he's like just turned 18, bought, and bought these guns, and, a bunch of people, right? Yeah, I, I don't speak for the Republican Party, so that's not really my role. I'm not their spokesperson, but I will say on your point about background checks, that you have universal background checks. The only time that you wouldn't have a background check done is when you're uh, instituting a private sale, usually between family members. Um, and then your question on waiting periods, uh, Uvalde might be the only example I can think of where a waiting period would have potentially curbed the shooter, but usually what happens in the case of a mass shooting so if someone is planning a shooting for so long that a short waiting period for guys is unfortunately not going to stop them. Um, and I believe in the constitutional right to bear arms for reasons beyond uh, what many people say. Um, usually it's to defend yourself against a tyrannical government. So that's what I think. Can I ask just a quick follow-up? Sure, go ahead. Um, of the two parties, Republicans yeah. and Democrats, um, who would you identify as being the party that's trying to in, uh, institute waiting periods and, and more uh, Oh, the Democrats definitely support more and, 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 why, and why is it not happening then? Why is it not happening with the Democrats? Because why, why, very, why is it the legislation not being passed? Because it's very politically unpopular. Because most of the American public say that they want gun control, but when you ask them on actual specific issues, they don't. Well, who's actually voting on the legislation? Who's voting against it? Sorry? Who's, vote, who's not in the Well, the Democrats have the majority, right? So if it's not getting passed, that's because Democrats aren't voting for it, right? I mean, we know Republicans aren't voting for it, but that means there are several Democrats who aren't voting for it as well. Right, that's what they, okay. That's part of the Republicans are the ones that are talking to you. That's Okay. Uh, Sweatshirt. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you for coming. Hi. Um, so would you personally support gun safety laws if uh, it would reduce homicide and crime rates? Thank you. What kind of gun safety laws? 
Uh, such so as uh, was mentioned earlier, or at least the raising the age of 21. No, I don't support that. outrageous that someone could serve in the military, live on their own, hold a job, and be of legal age to essentially do everything but drink, but not own a firearm. All right, so you mentioned the case of Daryl uh, Brooks, mm -hmm. a black man who drove his car to a Christmas parade of primarily white paraders, largely elderly and children, killing six and causing permanent life-altering injury to several more. This happened after he had previously expressed explicit racial hatred for white people. For instance, under the rapping alias, Math Boy Fly, he allegedly tweeted, quote, we start knocking white people back the fuck out. I don't want to hear it. The old white people too, knock them the fuck out, end quote. His rap songs contain similar sentiments. Brooks is currently on trial for this crime. There's no mention of his racial animus appearing in court, nor any plans to charge him with hate crimes. So there are similar cases like this, such as the 2020 murder of UC Berkeley student Seth Smith. My question to you is, do you believe or think Republicans have or should have any plans to address white victims of racially motivated hate crimes to serve them justice in the form of hate crime charges in these cases, which are not being applied? Yes, I do think hate crime charges should be applied equally, regardless of what the race of the victim is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, go ahead. So you are obviously very tough on crime, but you didn't mention anything on overpopulation of jails. And I'm curious to see what your take is on that, especially since part of the reason why there is such an overpopulation of jails is because of petty crimes and drug-related crimes. I would just be curious to hear what your take is on that. My take on overpopulation? Yeah, what would your solution be of overpopulation in jails? Well, if everyone in the jail deserves to be in there, then I guess you just got to build more jail cells. Right here. <laughs> and, um, you mentioned that there has been a rise in crime recently, and then there also has been a rise in poverty and mental health issues. So you mentioned that you want uh, more enforcement for crimes. So what are you doing to prevent crimes in the first place, like investing more in uh, un uh, poverty uh, communities or like investing? In yeah, there's a lot of ways. I mean, definitely, certainly reducing poverty, making sure that people are growing up I think all of those things have to happen at a young age for individuals to feel like they have a choice other than committing crime. Um, there's also a question of treating things like mental illness and drug addiction, which I mentioned. Um, so yeah, I think that's absolutely important. I think that should be a huge part of any person's platform to prevent crime. I guess my point is, if the crime happens, that doesn't mean that you don't hold the person accountable. So I know you just mentioned that if prisons are overcrowded, we should just build more. Um, but who will pay for that? Who will pay for building more prisons? And what cost, what, where will that cost fall? Will it be taxpayers? Most or, likely. Or, uh, yeah. But there's a lot of like, random stuff we pay for that isn't uh, fair and free. So let's redirect some funds if we have to. What I'm saying, and it's kind of a tongue in cheek answer, but what I meant by that is that obviously I think there's people in the criminal justice system who shouldn't be incarcerated. shouldn't be released just because we're worried about overpopulation. I think that's just kind of a side effect and not a bigger issue. Um, so you said that uh, you support, or you don't support gun control laws because you, because you like to go hunting. Do you need a male? That's not what I said, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I said I, I don't support gun control laws because I believe we have a right to bear arms so that if we have to, we can defend ourselves against a tyrannical government, which is why the Second Amendment was written into the Constitution. Yeah, but they all didn't exist at the time of the Second Amendment. Neither did the internet. Do you believe in free speech still? Or should we restrict how people speak on the internet? You didn't, you didn't. Hate crimes are not related to speech. They're related to actions. I'm sorry, but if you use a, a big pen, you're not allowed to uh, be against gun control because they didn't have big pens at the writing of the First Amendment. Okay. 
Um, back to the debate about prevention versus enforcement, what do you think should be the top priority? Enforcing um, to make sure crime doesn't happen or actually preventing it in the first place? Like, where should we put the Oh, of course preventing, because then you have fewer victims. Um, um, what do you think about like implementing programs or expanding programs um, in prisons to help people um, not reoffend against that there's education and job training and that? Yeah, I think that, that's a great measure. If they're effective, then we should be doing them. Um, also, in Canada, churches and prisons. Against the wall. Um, so, are a supporter of less gun restriction laws. Um, but what do you have to say, like, in terms of, like, you look at Australia, and they have very strict gun laws, and their homicide rates went down, their suicide rates went down, and you can apply that to a lot of other countries as well. So, and that's the science behind it. So how are you going to deny statistics and case studies that prove stricter gun laws and banning guns overall decreases crime rates? Australia and New Zealand also force their citizens into camps if they refuse to get vaccinated, and I don't think that would happen in America. Public health is different. Did the vaccine save people from catching COVID? Yes. 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 No. <laughs> no, the vaccine did not prevent people from catching COVID nor transmitting it, and the Pfizer CEO just testified this week to that fact. You can use a lab. Quiet, quiet. Go ahead. I understand your reasoning. I'm just saying the vaccine wasn't a good that wasn't a good reason for that. I don't think there's a justification for pulling people out of their homes and I was in COVID and I had two two shots at the time, so I would say I had to do the urgent care and everything. I would say the vaccine saved my life. If I didn't have it, I probably would have been worse off. That was a personal decision. Yeah. Um, okay, it's right here. Yeah. So I don't know how we got to vaccines, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite curious as to I was quite curious as to uh, your answer to their original question about whether yeah. you agree with New Zealand and Australia's gun rights policies and whether they've bettered the society and made them more safe, but then you redirected it towards vaccinations. But I'm curious as to whether you endorse Well, my point was that the, my primary reason for supporting gun rights, as I explained, is protection against the government, which was the reason that the Second Amendment was created. And the point is that I find that reason for owning guns more important than the public health aspect. Just to follow up to that, do you think that any faction in the United States of America today has the ability to overturn any government power at the federal level? Can you restate that? So do you think any faction in the United States of America based on an ideology could overturn a government that turns, uh, let's say... Are you asking if I support a revolution? Th that would be the point of preparing guns to you, right? Um, I mean, I don't personally support a revolution, but if the government came to me and wanted to take my guns, they probably wouldn't end well. I, I don't think then what would be the point of banning arms? Because you say that you want to... Because uh, it's self-defense. I think I deserve a chance, no? But if you guys... And also the fact that we got our asses kicked in Korea suggests that our uh, military government are not as great as they think they are. Also, I also don't know how we got back to guns here. I'm sorry, but... Um, I also... You have to like, also consider in this uh, hypothetical matchup, by the way, and this is not like a January 6th rally, um, that the government would be very unlikely to turn on people. So I view it as more of a preventive measure than a, we're going to go out and some blazing type thing. But uh, yes. Yeah. All the way in the back. This is getting really weird. I love it. Go ahead. It. <laughs> Louder? War on drugs and what? War on drugs. Yeah, I think uh, simple possession cases, I would not um, support locking people up for that, particularly not for as long as periods of time as they have been. Um, drug dealers, I think, are a different story. Um, they bring a lot of harm and violence into communities. Okay, I saw someone. Let's go, Hap. Um, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around <coughs> the doctrine of why 
Democrats are pushing for such progressive prosecution when it seems a very black and white issue to me personally when you commit a crime and you're prosecuted. Yeah. Um, wh what would you describe as the Democrats' goal in pushing for such progressive measures in prosecution and in crime? Yeah, so I hinted on it in my lecture, and I think all of this kind of stems from um, the idea that the reason a lot of people are in jail is due to systemic racism. Um, and I think there's sort of this idea from the left that if you uh, enforce fewer crimes or reduce the sentences, um, typically you're going to see that have a more positive effect on minorities because they tend to be either uh, offending at or being incarcerated at higher rates. But unfortunately, it's had this negative side effect that we've seen of just creating more crime for victims. That's my opinion, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I'd love to see studies on that. I mean, Scandinavian countries are fundamentally different from the U.S. for a lot of reasons, obviously. They're smaller, they tend to have uh, lower rates of poverty, things like that. So it's not a perfect one-to-one -one comparison. But, I mean, who wouldn't support a justice system that actually prevents people from reoffending and is able to ultimately release them out to become productive citizens? Yeah. Can you expand on that? Sorry? Can you expand on the churches? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's pretty common in, in, uh, in prisons. They usually have chaplains who actually come in and preach to a lot of the prisoners. You'll see um, many of them have sanctuaries or places where prisoners can go and pray. Um, and there are a lot of prisoners who do find uh, redemption and faith in God. And um, who's to say how much of it is sincere and how much of it is kind of saying the right thing? But I'm a big proponent that religion can change lives in positive ways. Is uh, religion constitutional if it's like a federal prison? As long as they're not uh, endorsing a certain religion, yeah. Red. <laughs> okay, oh, sorry, can you start over? Slower? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not into Islam. Okay. I, there's a lot of assumptions in this crowd. Okay, keep going. Go I was wondering about your perspective on for-profit prisons. I know a lot of people are making money off of incarcerated people, and a lot of corporations are using prisoners as cheap labor. So I was wondering about your perspective on that. Yeah, I, I definitely think there should be some type of review of for-profit prisons. I don't. Uh, I'd like to see as well whether or not, um, I guess what the relationship is between policing and the for-profit prisons, right? Like, is this causing people to get picked up more often? Is it causing them to have longer stays in the prison? I would definitely not support that. And I think in general, the prison should not be for-profit. Yeah, uh, so you mentioned uh, one of the factors that can actually, uh, well, paraphrasing, but you mentioned one of the factors that could help against can we family stability? Uh, like, uh, yeah. Around that, can you elaborate on that? I didn't really understand what you meant. Yeah, so I mean, if you look statistically at who is most likely to be incarcerated, um, one of the big factors in that is not having a father in the home or not having a stable family upbringing, so two parents in the home. Um, this is a huge factor in the black community in particular, um, uh, wherein they have higher rates of not having a male head of household, and so that has very damaging long-term effects on a person's ability to be integrated into society and to live a fruitful and productive life. So I uh, think that creating and encouraging uh, family stability would be a huge preventer of crime. Yeah, you talked about how Democrats have this goal of trying to get back like institutionalized basically every system, which is part of the family goal, which I entirely agree with. Mm -hmm. Do you see what Kodak has like, been failed at that goal? So 
how do we make that happen? We personally, we personally, we personally, we personally, we personally, we I care more about racism than job poetry. So how do we solve that? <laughs> sure. Um, that's a very good question. And I agree with you that the goal is obviously um, commendable. And the way that it's been gone about, unfortunately, I don't think has changed that because we have not addressed um, the real reasons why someone might commit a crime, right? So we're trying to catch people after the fact as, to, as opposed to preventing them from um, getting picked up in the first place. Um, there's also a question of just the communities that people live in. Unfortunately, um, minority communities tend to be policed more frequently, which does result in people of color um, being picked up more often for the same crimes or having encounters with police more often. Um, so there is a question as to how we make sure that different communities have um, equitable policing policies, I would say. Um, going back to the question about the for-profit prison, um, Republicans are historically anti-tax, and you said you're a proponent, a proponent of building more prisons. How do you propose to one, build these more prisons, and two, sustain having such a large number of inmates in these prisons while also being anti-tax and wanting the money to, yeah, while also yeah. being anti-for-profit? Uh, I'm a populist, so I'm not anti-tax. Yeah, the Republican Party. Um, like I said, I don't speak for them, but um, there is a lot of pork spending that I think could be used in more effective ways. Right here. Um, I was wondering, going back to the first buy. We'll get everybody. <laughs>